Hello and a big warm welcome to Science Live on a beanbag here on day two of the World Science Festival Brisbane. And joining me as a very, very friendly special co-host is my good friend Isla Nakano. How are you, Isla? I'm so well. Thank you, Ranger Stacey. It's great to be here. That's fantastic. Now, how is your red beanbag? I like to make sure everyone's comfortable. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great place to be. It is. It sure is a great place to be. And we've got a lot of stuff happening in the coming um, hours and days. But a little bit of background, Isla and I, we work together on a children's television program. And my, my passion, of course, is wildlife, the environment. Yours is science. So you're in the right place. Oh, absolutely. I love all things science. And as you said, it is my passion and I love communicating science as well. So this is an absolute dream. So what have you been up to since we last saw each other? Well, I've been doing more science communication, um, specifically working with teachers all across the Pacific um, and giving them ideas and tips and inspiration for using more kind of everyday items in their science classrooms. It's really important, isn't it, that kids, I mean, every, you know, because science is part of our everyday world and for kids to get excited about science is something that you are really, really keen on. Science is for everyone, I think. There's something for everyone, um, which is great because there is a lot of science going on here, isn't there? Oh, now, down to business, that's why we're here, of course, on our bean bags. Now, our role as hosts here at Science Live on a bean bag is, of course, to uh, interview and chat to people who are here at the festival, who are involved, because there are some really clever people and there are some amazing jobs out there in the realm of sci science. So, are you looking forward to meeting some cool people? Oh, absolutely. I cannot wait. And I can't wait. I'm going to get started with speaking to David Pollock, who's a musician, uh, a musical instrument maker and a composer. That sounds very cool. So while you get set up for that, I a little earlier had a chat to Dr Tanya Beer and she's an award-winning environmental designer and community artist. So I cannot wait for you to see that. But right now, let's take a look at the highlights from yesterday at the World Science Festival Brisbane. <laughs> It is day one of the World Science Festival and the people are coming through the doors. There is here to explore and learn all the wonders of science. I love science because it lets you figure out how things work. Here in Brisbane, all of the community can get involved, as well as bringing people from overseas here live streamed this time to enjoy science. Wow, what a wonderful highlights reel. Welcome to Science Live on a Beanbag. And right now, sharing the beanbags with me is artist. Despite what I said earlier, it is Lindsay Pollock. Thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure. Hi, Anna. Now, Lindsay, you're a... I'm going to have to consult my notes here. Apologies. Because okay. you are a musician, mm -hmm. an instrument maker, a composer, a musical director, and a community music facilitator. Tell me, what does your work involve? Um, well, all of those different threads all have music as the common or the commonality. So I, yeah, I, I actually have been making instruments now for over 40 years. Um, I've also worked as a musician um, for roughly that time. So I've sort of juggled um, that um, instrument making and uh, working as a performing musician and to the extent that I've pulled the instrument making into my solo shows. But I also have been very involved in community music because I believe that everybody is a musician, we're all creators, and that making music is even more fun than listening to music. Oh, fantastic, <laughs> I love that. Um, now, you did mention that you do make instruments, mm -hmm. but the instruments you make um, are from things like carrots and rubber, rubber gloves as well. Tell me, where does this idea come from? Well, it all started as a a 19 year old discovering a bamboo grove and suddenly thinking I really want to make a bamboo flute and so I made my first bamboo flute and I was hooked from that point so I, I, I um, started making bamboo flutes then I wanted to make wooden flutes so I taught myself wood turning uh, I ended up getting so interested in that that I, I went 
to Europe uh, and w basically went from mu museum to museum that had instrument collections, measured those in order to be able to make copies of early woodwind instruments. Uh, and then from that there was a sort of a, a jump where I sort of got excited by the idea of making instruments from found objects and the world around us in a way that can sort of make music fun and accessible and, and show us that we're all musicians. Do you have a particular place that you make your instruments or do you, any of your kind of art? Do you have a studio or...? I live uh, on the Sunshine Coast in a beautiful town called Mullaney or just outside Mullaney. So I have an instrument making workshop there and I have a studio there. So from there I'll work, I'll um, say for example rehearse together with Lizzie who I'm performing with here at the Science Festival. Um, I'll also record and compose there but then in the, in the workshop then I'll, I'll make instruments and at the moment in the workshop I'm more concentrating on going back to the, the wooden instruments and a few new designs of my own that I've been developing over the last few years. Have you always wanted to be all the things that we've already described or did you want to do something else? Well yeah as, as I said it was sort of a little bit of a, a jump, the, the Bamboo Grove experience. At that time um, I was at, launched into a, a science degree and so I thought I was going to become a neurophysiologist. So I actually got as far as um, second year uni and studying physiology and the instrument making sort of, sort of took over. I just fell in love with it so much. And so as I mentioned, I was making the bamboo flutes. So I was going to uni, I dropped back to part time and I would sell my bamboo flutes outside the, the Fisher Library at Sydney Uni. And then I got to the point where now this is what I want to do. And so I sort of, I deferred. So I'm, I'm going back any time, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the original plan, but yeah, it didn't sort of quite happen that way. Do you think you use any science in kind of the music making that you do? Oh, absolutely. I mean, science is in everything, really. And, um, and music especially, um, whether we're looking at the acoustics of instruments and, and, and looking at the sort of physical properties of sound waves or... Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, science is intrinsic, really, in everything we do. And I'm trying to make music more and more intrinsic in everything we do as well. So the, the two are very much connected. You've done a TED Talk on creativity um, and it's drummed up over an incredible 5 million views or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm, yep. Did you ever think that you'd have so many people watching you make a carrot clarinet? Um, no, it's sort of not the sort of thing that you go into something like that sort of, you know, even thinking about that. So um, it certainly, it, it sort of obviously um, tweaked and piqued people's imagination. I, th I think people love seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary and uh, um, the, for me creativity is the, the art or the, or the putting of two un previously unrelated things together, whether those are material objects or whether they're ideas. Um, so creativity is about combining different things to create something new. And the idea of um, the carrot, for me, there's a definitely an agenda in that. It's not just about the quirkiness of drilling out a carrot and making a clarinet in front of an audience. Um, it's sort of showing people not to take things for granted, that, uh, that all sorts of things can happen when we look at the world with a different and, and new eyes. So for me... Um, that's what the clarinet, the carrot clarinet is about. But it's also important that it sounds great. So um, if, for example, I was to go and hide behind the, the wall of the tent and play that, to you, it would, if you didn't know it was a carrot, you would just assume it was a clarinet. That's wonderful. Now, Lindsay has loads of things that uh, he's doing here at the World Science Festival Brisbane over the next few days. Starting tonight, um, you've got Dangerous Song here mm -hmm. at the World Science Festival Brisbane. Come check it out, folks. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me. And um, we'll see you on Saturday for Paper, Scissors, Rock. OK. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Now, earlier today, Stacey caught up with Tanya Beer to talk about art and science. Thank you.
Dr. Tanya Beer, thank you so much for joining us on Science Live on a beanbag. Are you comfortable on your red beanbag? Pretty comfy. Excellent. Great now, to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here. Um, it's a beautiful, relaxing area. And I know that you're going to enjoy looking around and, and checking out what is on offer. And you do have a special role a little bit later on. I know that. But let's get to what you do. Now, I, I have it on my little bit of paper here that you're an artist and designer. Does that encompass what you do? Tell us about yourself. Yes, absolutely. Um, I guess I call myself an ecological designer and a community artist. And I'm also a lecturer in interior spatial design at Griffith University. One of your famous works, and I have a little birdie told me a little bit about it and it just sounds really out there, The Living Stage. Tell me about that. Yeah, so The Living Stage is one of my signature projects that I've been developing for the last eight years. And The Living Stage is a recyclable, biodegradable, edible, biodiverse performance space that combines community engagement, horticulture and stage design. So that's a lot. <laughs> it, it is a lot and it sounds very artistic but also very environmentally friendly at the same it time. It is, yes. It's all about making sustainability fun and engaging and um, it works like this. Basically, we build the stage with the local community. Uh, we grow lots of plants, lots of edible plants. Um, we also do a lot of work around biodiversity, so that's where the science comes in. Uh, then we invite the community to come and perform in the space and we work with people from all walks of life, including professional performers, and then we eat the stage. I'd like to be part of that. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody loves an edible stage. Basically. I've never <laughs> actually seen an edible stage, but I'd have to check out the living stage. It's a pretty healthy one. <laughs> it sounds amazing. And it really is the full cycle, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yep. After the event, um, the stage is basically consumed, literally, <laughs> by the community. So, uh, yeah, so garden beds become... Uh, places for community gardens, people eat the food and there's also compost. So it's all, the whole idea is it's a circular process. Is that whole concept like a world first? I guess, oh, it's hard to know if it's a world first because there's so much work going on out there. But I guess it is quite unique in its process. And we've done seven living stages all over the world um, and they're always unique to site and community. So no living stage is ever the same, which is also part of the uniqueness of it. Um, the first one was in Castlemaine in regional Victoria. It's travelled to all sorts of places in the UK and uh, one of my favourite ones was in New York on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Okay, now tonight here at World Science Festival Brisbane, mm -hmm. uh, right here, just not, not far from here in the Nucleus at 6pm, you're um, going to be featuring in an event called Sustainability in Art and Design. Can you give us a little insight into that? Yes, yeah, so I'm, what I, I guess what a lot of my work is about is about using art and design to forefront sustainability. And again, like The Living Stage, doing this in a fun and inventive way. So I'm really interested in the role that art can play in forefronting environmental issues and doing that in a way that tugs at the heartstrings and makes people aware of sustainability in unique and uh, engaging ways. Now, of course, this is a science festival. Yes. So is there a science to art or is there an art to science? Is that a strange question or what? I think that's a lovely question because I think art and science should be more um, more together than they often are. Often there is art on one side and, and uh, science on the other. And really, um, to be a scientist uh, and to be an innovator, I think you have to have imagination and, um, and that's a big part of being a scientist. And for me, as an artist, I love to bring a scientific rigor to my work. So it's two parts of the brain or two ways of looking at the world. My husband is a scientist and I'm an artist. So I guess I'm all, I've always been attracted to science and uh, the scientific brain. Wonderful. So there is that connection. Yes. Yes. And um, creative in their own own special ways. Exactly. Slightly different different ways of looking at the world, but both are important. Now, finally, is there a place in the whole world, once we can travel again, where you would like to design something? I would love to do more living stages. And as soon as we can start traveling again, I would love to do a living stage in a place like Sao Paulo or in Singapore or in Vienna. Uh, I'd love to continue exploring different cultures and um, how, how different cultures see the world through plants and, and nature.
Well, thanks, Tanya, for being here on the Red Bean Bags for Science Live. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and well done for inspiring a next generation of designers and artists as well. And good luck for the event tonight here at the World Science Festival. Thanks so much for having me. Wow, an edible stage. That sounds fascinating. And there's loads more cool things happening here at the World Festival, uh, World Science Festival Brisbane, rather. Now, soon we are going to talk to Tony Matthews about the cities of the future. But before we do, we're going to watch a quick video from our Cool Job series about designing robots into the future. My name is Amelia Liu. I have the coolest job in the world because I get to play with robots for a living. My name is Professor Jonathan Roberts and science helps me make amazing advances in robotics. So a typical day for us is to go and visit a site. So we may go and visit a factory and we'll try and understand their problems. They often approach us because they've got problems that they think a robot can solve. So we'll go and see the exact problem, try and work out the crux of the issue. And then from then on, my job is to then incorporate the robotics and build this machine together, whether in simulation or actually on the robot. And try and prototype a solution for them. So an interesting fact about my job is, as a mechatronics engineer, we often have to actually build things twice. The first time to just figure out what we actually need to build, and then the second time to actually build this thing. What inspired me to get into robotics was, of course, Star Wars. I was just exactly that age that I was seven years old when Star Wars came out, and I saw R2-D2 and C-3PO, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. So day to day here we use lots of cool technology, of course we use robots and as part of those robots they have interesting things on board like sensors, um, that might be camera based systems, there might be encoders that measure the joints. Using depth cameras, using lidars, using laser systems, but as well as using different types of end effectors for the robots, so all types of manipulators, grippers, suction cups, all that sort of stuff. We of course also use 3D printers to prototype and a lot of mechanical parts as well. There's a lot of special mechanical engineering that's done here when we need to do a special job. So some of the STEM activities that are relevant uh, to robotics are uh, mathematics, which is incredibly important. Um, you really need to understand your maths to become an engineer. Um, we are very interested in people that know computer programming the modern era and particularly robotics is very heavily reliant on programming and of course um, students these days do that at school which is fantastic. We also need people that love building things so mechanical engineering is a fantastic thing. Uh, electrical engineering is vital and electronics. Um, so we, and it, really robotics is a combination of all those things so we tend to need teams of people to work together to actually build robots. So to anybody interested in studying robotics uh, in high school, I did the advanced level of mathematics and actually biology, funnily enough. But in university, I actually studied a Bachelor of Engineering, majoring in mechatronics at QUT. A lot of the people I work with are mechatronics engineers. And mechatronics is a blend of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, electronics and computer science. I moved to QUT and became professor of robotics. And my remit there was to expand the robotics activity at QUT and my passion now has become how to get manufacturing industry to adopt robotics and this is particularly small manufacturing industries where they typically wouldn't use robots and how they can adopt robots to help their business. So from school I went and did uh, aerospace engineering at university and I was fascinated by spacecraft design. I then moved on to do a PhD at the same university doing computer vision and that was in the area of driverless cars. And my particular part of that was from the, your robot driverless car, how does that car see other cars? I then moved to Australia and started in the area of mining robotics and particularly vision systems for robots in mines so they could kind of see what they're doing. I then went into the area of underwater robots, flying robots. Uh, we started to do some of the first work in Australia on so-called UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, and we developed again vision-based systems for these helicopters to fly around all by themselves. I then moved to QUT uh, and became a professor of robotics at QUT, 
and now I kind of have a very wide remit to investigate all sorts of robotics and I'm particularly interested at the moment in uh, robots that help manufacturing. What I find fascinating about my job is all the diverse things that we get to do and being able to do my part in helping to revive the manufacturing industry in Australia. I'm most proud of the fact that when we started robotics in Brisbane back in the mid-90s it was a very tiny niche thing and now it's a big deal. You know, Brisbane is pretty much the centre of robotics in Australia uh, and it's only growing. So what I'm most proud of is the collaborative nature of all the work that we do here and as well as the multidisciplinary teams that we get to work in and how we all get to grow and learn from each other. The ultimate question for me is how to build a robot that can learn by itself. Welcome to Science Live and sitting opposite me on the beanbag is Dr. Tony Matthews who will be appearing on a panel discussion for Cities 2060, that seems like a long way in the future, a little bit later today. Tony, congratulations, you're here at the Science Festival in Brisbane, how's the red beanbag for you? Great, great, thank you Stacey, it's wonderful to be here, the red beanbag is very comfortable and it's, it it's lovely comfy. to do this. It's great, now you've just arrived at the Science Festival, I, I know you're looking forward to the panel discussion a little bit later on, but right now about you now your job sounds fascinating so is it pretty much in a nutshell about how to design like the ideal city to build better cities yeah that's part of what we do I guess what we do is we we look into the future and we cast our eye on some of the challenges that are coming down the track and we try and research how to best meet those challenges and and then try and find or try and translate those findings into into policy and practice in the hope that they're taken up and and that those ideas translate so in the future will we, we be flying around in cars Let's do hoverboards first. Fair enough. Now in Australia, where do people live? It seems like, you know, the people are very keen on living, you know, close to the coast. What's the, do you have any uh, statistics about how many people live in the rural or country areas versus the city? And also, you know, wider spread as well. Where do people like to live? Australians love living in cities. Nine out of ten Australians live in cities, which is, is one of the highest levels in the world. And, and so, you know, if you want to think about Australia as being a type of a country, it's a very urban country because it's, it's massive but mostly empty. And then 90% of people are, are, are in our cities, most of those in our capital cities along the eastern seaboard. So there's a, a vast relative emptiness everywhere else and then most of us are so do you think that trend will change with people living in the cities so many people living on our coasts or do you think they will end up moving to the more regional areas well there's a little bit of a trend towards regional areas at the moment some people have taken their jobs from capital cities and moved to regional areas or regional cities but most of those are still quite close to the coast if not on the coast the real question is whether we're going to see serious migration inland and I suspect probably not. And most Australian settlements anyway start to filter out about 50 or 100 k's from the coastline. It starts getting very rural. And I don't see any real potential or likelihood that we're going to start seeing major developments in central Australia, for example. Tony, do you have a, a favourite Aussie city, other than Brisbane, of course? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I've lived in Brisbane a long time and I really do like it, so I'll, I'll, I won't be a hometown guy. Uh, if I can't do Brisbane, I'll, I'll pick Hobart because it reminds me of Cork in Ireland, where I came from, my home city. It's a similar size, similar look, similar feel. So uh, there's something about Hobart that makes me feel very at home, so I'm going to go with that one. Well, I've got to say, I, I love your accent, so I could listen to that all day. And I have been over to Ireland and, and Cork, so I totally get where you're coming from. Now, do you think that um, there is an ideal city, or is it just the people that live in the city and their way of life? Is there an ideal? Well, your ideal may not be my ideal. There are some characteristics of what we would consider to be a very good city, but it's a combination of things. It's people, it's place, it's buildings, it's form, it's function, it's atmosphere, it's, it's history, it's culture. And it can be hard to assemble those things. You know, they, 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 they happen naturally a lot of the time and organically. And, and, and trying to be too proactive about planning those things or building those things doesn't always work out well. So there are many great cities around, but uh, it's, it's so, somewhat of a subjective experience, I think. Now I think I sort of already know the answer to this question, but do you think our Aussie cities will just continue to get bigger? 
Unfortunately, yes, and particularly the, the capital cities are continuing to expand into large metropolitan areas, and we really should be looking to more evenly distribute population, and that has long been a challenge in this country, and one that we're not necessarily much closer to solving, and without getting too far into it, it's, it's largely because of the distribution of, of urban management powers between levels of government. Do you think uh, climate change is a factor in our big cities and, and the way things are going to go in the future? I think it will be. I mean, Australian cities are quite vulnerable to a number of things, including extreme weather, and certainly over time climate change is likely to exacerbate that. There's also likely to be some elevated risk because so many Australian cities are coastal, so that's another risk factor, and as climate change gets more severe, then that risk profile will, will increase and will increase more so because of the coastal uh, proximity. Well, we've certainly have we've had you know some big events just in recent times with the floods and and bushfires and things like that. So you know that is an extra element to I guess to um, you know to to look at when you're designing and and thinking about the future. Yeah, and that's a lot of the work that I do is 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 in a space called climate change adaptation, where we're trying to prepare cities for some of these um, inevitable impacts and and trying to put them together or assemble them or reassemble them in some way that, that allows them to get through some of that severe uh, weather and those extreme events better. Um, it's a sort of a, a, res a form of resilience planning. It's, it's something that's been going on for quite some years now in this country. Well, it's certainly a, a fascinating topic and something that is always evolving. Now for a bit of fun, Dr. Tony, um, what I like to do is a little game called A Meal From Where, okay? So I say a trademark meal and you tell me which city specifically you'd like to eat that meal in. Okay, there are no wrong answers. Okay, and tell me why. Fish and chips. Back home in Cork. Why? Because we do it better than the English ever did. Excellent. A curry of any sort you choose. Um, well, if I'm not going to go to, uh, to India, then I think I'd probably find somewhere in London for that. They do do a good curry. Uh, what about pizza? Naples. Oh, yeah. You're talking my language. Lamingtons. Are you a fan? I am a fan. Let's go with Adelaide because there's something genteel about Lamingtons and Adelaide's a very genteel place. Very good. There's some good cities there. Um, Brisbane, what's your, what's your meal in Brizzy? I really like getting out to Sunnybank and having a, a nice plate of noodles. So funny enough, that's my Brizzy meal. Fantastic. Each to their own, I guess. And there's certainly, the good thing is it's diverse. We've got lots of, and lots and lots and lots of choice. Okay, now you can catch uh, Dr. Tony, Will, Tony Matthews um, later today at Cities 2060. Seems like a long way away, but it's uh, probably just around the corner. It's not as far as we think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. It's been well, my a, a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. That was great. On with the program. Wow, that was fascinating. Welcome back to Beanbags. Um, and today, or right now actually, we're going to have another peek at the goings on behind the World, Festi World Science Festival Brisbane. And I have with me from the Queensland Museum, Alison Douglas. Alison, is it fair to say that in your job you stuff things up on purpose? Well, yes, uh, thanks Isla. <laughs> um, I do, uh, in fact, stuff things up or stuff things up things. <laughs> um, uh, I, you might have guessed, I'm a, a taxidermist um, at the Queensland Museum. So um, uh, most of you probably know what taxidermy is. It's, um, uh, it involves uh, sort of arranging the skin of an uh, animal, usually a, m a mammal or a bird, in a lifelike pose. Um, and the uh, the aim is to get the animal looking as uh, lifelike as possible. And in a museum context, we, context we use uh, taxidermy um, in our uh, displays. Um, uh, it it is a um, a very uh, effective way to um, uh, to um, explain uh, and showcase uh, the wildlife of the world to people who might otherwise not see it. And uh, so that's our aim with museum taxidermy, and I'm exclusively a museum taxidermist. Um, uh, we also um, uh, use the process of taxidermy in our collections because uh, lots of people don't know, but the Queensland Museum um, and museums around the world have extensive scientific collections that are usually not seen by the public but used by scientists. Um, uh, for all sorts of different uh, science and, and um, uh, investigation into the natural world. Um, so lots of those animals need to be 
prepared so that they can last forever in, in that uh, collection setting. So that's my job. <laughs> do you do every animal? <laughs> Well, um, taxidermy usually just involves birds and mammals are the main things. Um, you can uh, taxiderm fish, um, but uh, these days mostly we cast the, the softer bodied animals like fish and, and snakes and reptiles and things. So they tend to be cast and painted. Uh, but birds and mammals are, are the main um, taxidermied animals, yep. Yeah. How did you even get into taxidermy? <laughs> I know it's a really strange profession to find myself in. I actually started as a visual artist, um, went to art college uh, and did all sorts of things, sort of worked in theatre, made puppets, worked in the public art space. Uh, and I do do my own art practice. Um, but uh, I managed to get in uh, to, the, to the museum and, and work with the exhibitions team. and. Part of that job involved learning and um, producing taxidermy and it's not for everybody but um, I'm really fascinated by animals and um, and there's a real art to it. It's quite a sculptural uh, practice once you've sort of got beyond um, preparing and skinning the animal. You you need to make the, uh, the body that goes inside so it ends up being quite a, a sculptural um, uh, activity and um, uh, and so there's actually a lot of room for the for art within um, within the profession and uh, the same goes for the other work I do with the cast painting and um, and uh, we're really aiming to um, replicate as closely as possible um, nature so that we can uh, showcase it for people that come through the museum Amazing, that's great. <laughs> and you are going to be on stage at the World Science Festival Brisbane for Creative Collisions tonight, which is going to be fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and best of luck, Alison. Thanks, Isla. Now, to wrap up Science Live, we'll leave you with a video about Dr Colin Limpus, one of our national treasures. He has led turtle conservation and protection at Mon Repo, helping to restore the national habit or the natural habitat of marine turtles on Queensland's southeast coast. My earliest memories of my father bringing me down to, to Mon Repo Beach and, and teaching me how to find turtle eggs, how to be around turtles without scaring them off and, and things like that. Um, and so I grew up in the, the area and virtually every summer, you know, have been on the beach enjoying the turtles. I'm Dr. Cole Limpus. Um, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Aquatic Threatened Species Unit within the um, Department of Environment and Science and one of the major divisions within the department is the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service and I'm part of that uh, system of, of conservation of species and landform within the, the department. Well, Mon Repo as a, uh, an area, I mean, it's been part of my life uh, for my whole life. In um, 1979, people wanted to have a, a cash flow for communities out of turtles and the usual way of having a cash flow was to harvest them, either the turtles or their eggs, and sell them. Wherever that was occurring, it was not sustainable and the turtle populations would be severely depleted as a consequence of it. I, I suggested that we needed to try and develop an alternate approach uh, for um, managing turtles so that there could be a, a economic value to the district economy without being detrimental. Uh, to the, the turtle population. So we were doing a lot of research, looking at uh, the sorts of things that were disturbance factors to the turtles, things that would um, reduce nesting success, things that would cause failure of, of hatching and, and those sorts of things. And so we proposed um, a, an ecotourism around turtles with some quite specific guidelines that came out of our research. Initial intent of this, of course, as I said, was to create an, an economic value to the district community. In uh, 1978, I attended a uh, meeting of the 
International Union for Conservation of Nature uh, Sea Turtle Specialist Group Management Committee. Um, at that meeting in, in um, uh, Toronto, in Canada, the chairman um, introduced some results of new research that had just been published that uh, identified freshwater turtles and terrestrial turtles in Europe. The, te the sex of the, the hatchlings was determined by the temperature of the nest, not by sex chromosomes. To know that we had a huge variation in sand temperatures on our beaches from New South Wales up to North Queensland, it could have some quite significant consequences. That, that next summer, we actually began some systematic incubation of eggs under controlled temperatures. Our group was one of the first two labs in the world to, to demonstrate that marine turtles have this temperature dependent sex determination where the temperature of the nest determines what sex the hatchlings are and um, that uh, this is a, a, um, an issue that has to be worried about as you manage your beaches. As we get into around about uh, 1990, we start to get the ideas of climate change and particularly global warming um, coming out of the, the global scientific community. And we already had the knowledge that, hey, we're gonna have a problem if the, the environment keeps warming. So we've now got a situation where we've got beaches that are excessively warm and we're not getting enough males and also with excessive warmth, we get reduced hatch success. So do we sit back and, and let the turtles just die out? Our decision is no. We're looking for solutions uh, for how can we manipulate the sand temperatures so that we can maintain populations uh, secure until the, the global governments correct the, the climate change issue. The data we've collected on sand temperature over the years, you can see very clearly that when you get heavy rain, sand temperature drops. This is a, a control site where we don't have any artificial rain. Um, and the sand temperature down at the depth of the eggs uh, will be about two degrees warmer than um, the sand uh, underneath where we have one hour of light rain a day. Uh, so. It's, it's proving uh, that we can manipulate sand temperatures. What we're looking at are the results of this year is by looking at half an hour, one hour, one and a half, two hours of rain, what's the, the optimal uh, amount of rain that we need to give us the best cooling uh, so that we can keep sand temperatures down in a, a healthy range for the eggs. We've just been talking about the uh, use of artificial rain but we can also use shade. And so this is one of our experimental areas for trying to uh, change temperature using shade. Um, and uh, we've got clutches that have been uh, placed up here. These aren't natural nests up here, uh, so that uh, we can look at the effect of the shade on hatching success and things like that. The work at night, of course, with the, the nesting turtles for the tagging of them, we're at the end of the nesting season and, and so there's not many still nesting and we're now at peak of hatching at the moment, so we're assessing the, the hatching success. And that happens every afternoon uh, on the beach and through the night. This ingestion of marine debris, particularly the plastics, is a pretty new phenomenon. You know, if you, I've made the comment to a few people that thinking back to the early necropsies that I did of, of um, turtles that washed in dead back in the, the late 60s, early 70s, we never saw plastic debris in their gut. Um, and um, now um, we're, we're seeing it quite regularly. Um, a significant number of them are eating the fragments of, of floating plastic um, and it's blocking their gut and, and causing elevated mortality. What I'm finding is that the goalposts keep shifting, that the issues that we started with 
are behind us and over the decades new issues crop up. So it's been a continuing challenge to, to address each of the, the new problems as we become aware of them. And um, the research that we've done is so intellectually stimulating. Um, working with the postgrads has, has been a, a real pleasure. Um, seeing them develop and, and um, uh, finding um, novel uh, understandings and, and solutions. Um, and so, um, while I can still enjoy it and, and uh, be making a contribution, um, I'm not thinking any of those dirty words that you perhaps were, were wanting to use, like retirement. That's just not, not on the, the um, cards at the moment while I'm enjoying um, the, the work I do. I've had a long association with the Queensland Museum before I got involved in, in sea turtle studies. I was working with the um, curator of reptiles in those days and then when the museum got the, the opportunity to hold the, the uh, World Science Festival here in, in Queensland, I'd uh, developed a see-through incubator that uh, allowed uh, us to be able to watch eggs hatching and so we uh, thought that we could develop that further and then drawing on all of our um, research we'd done on incubation of eggs with temperature dependent sex determination, um, I could uh, give him a recipe for how we could gather eggs on a, a particular night, incubate them at a particular temperature and have them hatch on the day that he wanted to have eggs hatching in the Queensland Museum uh, for the, the festival. And so we've been doing that each year ever since the, the festival began. It's satisfying. It's uh, a challenge to make it happen um, and um, yeah, it makes you feel good that, that you can contribute into this uh, broader education of the public um, and um, along with it there's a whole lot of extra science that, that gets uh, uh, learnt as we go.